I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm tired, okay. That's an unfortunate mistake given the title of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, good evening everyone. Um, it's great to be here and it's a pleasure to speak after so many amazing speakers. So I'm going to try and bring the engagement up a little bit to finish this off. So I'm going to ask you some questions that might seem a little bit weird at first, but I promise there's a reason I'm asking them. This meal, how many grams of carbohydrate do you think are in it? Feel free to shout out, give me some numbers. 120, 150. 200, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and what about this? This is a drink, right? Drinks don't tend to have carbohydrates in, but you know, I was British, like to drink beer. How many do you think is in this one? If I was to guess, I'd probably say around the 20 gram mark, I think, something around there. And a salad, right? People eat salad when they're trying to lose weight. Like, this is healthy. Like, this can't have any carbohydrates in it. It does. So, one answer when I was asking this, you might be too polite to say so, but who cares? Um, Typically, people only care about calories and protein. It's the only thing that matters. And usually, you only care about that if you're trying to gain weight or lose muscle. Or <laughs> gain muscle or lose weight, even. Well, it turns out there's around 8 million people globally who really, really care about how many carbs are in these things. There's around 7,000 of them in Singapore. And there's probably a few of them in this room. There's definitely one. I'm Matt Boyle. I'm an engineering manager at Cloudflare for around 50 to 60 hours a week. But I have a second job, which is being a full-time pancreas. Um, I wrote a couple of books about Go, we've just given someone out, and there's another one I wrote which is called X Days of Go, it's available free on LeanPub, so check that out. In this talk, I'm going to talk about what I learned from being on call for large incidents, and how that, plus a tiny bit of Go, has helped me to stay alive for the past few years. In 2020, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Chances are you've heard of diabetes, and you probably know someone who has it, or you've been impacted by it in your family, but you might not have heard of type 1. Before my diagnosis, I wasn't very familiar with it. So here's a brief primer. So type 1 is an autoimmune condition where the pancreas produces little to no insulin, which is a hormone essential for converting carbohydrates into energy. This means insulin has to be injected to supplement the fact that you don't produce it. How much do you inject? It kind of depends what you're eating, if it has alcohol in it, and honestly, sometimes it just feels random. Like, what cycle of the moon are we in? Maybe that determines it. Type 1 is not caused by lifestyle, and it does not have a cure. In practice, this means type 1 diabetics have to monitor their blood sugar at all times. If it's too high for too long, it could lead to long-term damage and a shortened lifespan. If it's too low, even for a short period, it can be fatal. Sometimes if it gets too low, I'm effectively paralyzed, and I'm unable to eat or drink carbs safely, and I might need support. Thankfully, for me at least, this is rare. However, it's a condition you very much need to respect, and never take your eye off the ball, as one mistake could be fatal. With type 1, simple things are really taxing. Whenever I see food or drink, like I showed you, I'm kind of doing mental gymnastics to try and figure out how much insulin I need to inject and the impact it will have on my day. If you were down the downstairs having lunch, you might have seen me like looking around trying to figure out what was the right thing for me to eat, given that I knew I was going to be up here a little bit later. Throughout this talk, I'm going to use the term blood glucose and blood sugar interchangeably. They're the same thing, I just have a bad habit of using them interchangeably, so I thought I'd call that out. So there's never actually been a better time in history to be a type 1 diabetic. And I think that every year that goes by, it's going to get even better and more true, that statement. So in the short time since my own diagnosis, technology has come a long way for health monitoring. And I can now monitor my blood glucose wearing a device on my arm. Previously, you would have had to use one of these machines to take a, pink, uh, a prick on your finger, put it into the machine, wait for it to process. And typically, diabetics would do that six to eight times a day at a minimum. I still have to do that occasionally, but most of the time, I can depend on the monitor on my arm. Here's an incredibly flattering picture of me wearing my monitor. And if anyone wants to know, I am available for modeling work too. I have to change this every two weeks. And as I said, it's a little pinprick that goes into my arm. It takes readings of my blood when I tap my phone against the device. If it goes below the red line, I need to eat some carbohydrates. If it goes outside of the green range, I need to take some action, which can include taking insulin, or it might be doing a little bit of exercise. It gets more complicated than this, though. As I said, doing exercise can hate milk it, make it drop, which can be helpful, but it can also be a bad thing. Being sick changes your insulin uh, sensitivity, and so management is actually a constant moving target. It's therefore essential to have a dynamic approach towards management. Also, for reasons that I'm not quite sure, sometimes this happens. During this period, I'm not able to take my blood glucose levels using the device, and I would also not receive alerts. If my blood sugar was to reach dangerous levels, um, I wouldn't be in a hold about it. 
This error has a habit of showing up at the most stressful times. In the first few months of my diagnosis, I was really struggling to control my blood sugar, and I was completely dependent on this monitor. Even today, I have periods where my blood sugar goes low, and I don't really know why. If visibility was to drop to zero like this uh, whilst I was at work, we'd declare an incident, and we would not close it until visibility was restored. Furthermore, my blood glucose going low is the first signal that something is going wrong and an action should be taken. I wonder if we can apply the same thinking that I apply to incidents at work to my blood sugar. I started this talk by mentioning that being on call and what I learned from it uh, helped me to build the system I'm going to describe shortly. So let's just take a quick break, uh, break talking about diabetes to talk about another part of my life, which is being an engineering manager at Cloudflare. At Cloudflare, we take incidents really seriously. This also means when we see an issue, we try and fix it as quickly as possible. By doing this, we can typically stop small incidents becoming big incidents. If anyone in the company or an automated system detects that something is not working as it should, we raise an incident. It's not quite a big red button that we press, but it's not too far away. We've developed internal tools and bots that can be used to raise incidents, manage the process, and generate incident reports at the end. To detect and raise incidents, we use familiar suspects. We use Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, and PagerDuty, Duty, as well as some of our own tools that we wrote in Go. Prometheus is an open source tool used for event monitoring and alerting. It's very powerful, and it's a great option for storing time series data in. Grafana works really well with Prometheus, and it allows you to build beautiful dashboards over the top of that data. Alert Manager allows you to configure alerts for specific queries to trigger pages. And PagerDuty is the only application on my phone that gives me dread when I see a push notification for it. It's worth noting most of these tools are written in Go. I mention these tools mostly as I thought it may be interesting to hear what Cloudflare uses, but I'll also be using some of them later on in my talk. Every engineering manager at Cloudflare and some senior contributors receive training what we call being an incident commander. It's not quite as glamorous as this image generated by Dali3, but I do know some engineers who have widescreen monitors as big as this. As an incident commander, you're empowered and encouraged to pull anyone in from anywhere in the company to resolve the incident as quickly as possible. By the resolve, it means resolve customer impact, which means you've got to identify, maybe put in a short-term fix, uh, and identify and record long-term actions and a plan to get those implemented. We then do a review of every incident to ensure what we learn and to take the necessary steps to ensure it does not happen again. At this point, you're either thinking, why do we start talking about diabetes and blood glucose management, and now we're talking about incident management? So let's make the link. Successful um, incident management is all about collaboration and working together towards a common goal, which is usually to restore behavior that existed before the incident. Typically, you have experts in particular areas, but you also have escalation paths. In an ideal world, you engage as few people as possible to resolve the incident, because being paged is really disruptive. However, it's much less disruptive than ignoring the signals and trying to repair something that's completely broken. I wanted to apply the same thinking to managing my blood sugar. If something happens which causes my blood sugar to trend down, I want to be notified so that I can take an action before any major issue appears. However, if things do take a turn for the worse, or I'm unable to self-resolve, I want to feel good about the fact that someone else will get notified, and if I'm unable to help myself, they can help me and hopefully prevent what uh, was hopefully a P3 incident becoming a P0 incident. So let's go back here. I really wanted to get to a place where I felt confident if my device was taking no readings or I was critically low, myself or someone else would be notified regardless. The device picture is closed source. It does not give an easy way for you to build on top of it. It doesn't have an APIs, and it certainly has no SDKs. I spent some time trying to get the data off of it, but I couldn't find an obvious solution. So I started looking elsewhere. After some research, I found this device. This clips over the top of the other device on my arm and effectively uh, mimics a scan. And every two minutes, it sends results to this other app, which is called Tomato. The really nice thing I found about this is even when the main device would show me the error, this one would continue to publish data. After playing around, it seemed the main app didn't like sending data that it felt was anomalous, like due to a sudden change in blood sugar. However, I personally would rather know about this, and I can make that decision myself on what's anomalous, rather than letting the device make it for me. Something else really neat is this device includes a clever hack. And what it effectively does is it publishes your blood sugar um, to Google Calendar every five minutes as an event. By doing this, you can use Apple's native complications to see your blood sugar on your Apple Watch. I found this really interesting, and it got my brain worrying, as this means there must be a way to submit blood glucose to a third-party API. I just need to figure out how to do it. Whilst looking through the app, I saw in the settings it has this data sync option that you could enter a URL. It was intended to be used for an open source tool called Night Scout. However, instead of entering a Night Scout URL, I pointed at a web server I had running. 
I entered the URL and hit submit, and I saw these log lines show up in my gateway. I now knew what endpoint the device was trying to submit data to, but not what that request looked like. To solve this, I wrote a really simple echo server using Go, and it matches the route that we saw previously in the gateway logs. To deploy, I'm using Encore.dev, which is one of the fastest way I've found to deploy Go apps. The annotation at the top is the instructions for, uh, to tell Encore where my HTTP handler will run. There is no main.go, this is it. An echo server, is a re an echo server is a, uh, that sends the data back to you. Uh, let me try that again. An echo server is a server that sends the same data back to you that um, it received. Whenever you send to an echo server, it echoes back to you. The concept is simple, but it can be really useful for network troubleshooting, application behavior testing, or something like this. Echo servers are a useful tool in any language, but they're exceptionally easy to write and go. This one's barely three lines long. It does everything that we need it to. I repeated the same exercise for some of the other requests I saw in the gateway, and I came upon this one. This one's perfect. This call was being made every two minutes, so it kind of matched what I expected to be happening, and it included this in the response. Uh, in the request, sorry. So it contains SGV, which is my blood glucose. Um, one thing to call out is the number here seems really high. You're going to see like some different uh, scales used throughout this. So uh, in the UK, we basically divide this number by 18. So you're going to see much lower numbers from here on out. Um, it gives a date time. It gives a trend direction. So now I have everything I need to actually start plotting my own blood glucose and storing it myself. So we have the endpoint we can submit readings to. So I made a gauge, and I set my blood sugar every time I receive a request. A gauge is a metric that is exposed and represents a single numeric value that can go up or down. It's typically used for values that fluctuate, such as memory usage, uh, number of concurrent requests, temperature, or it turns out, blood sugar. I also best effort store the data in Postgres. This is probably the only use case I've ever come across where the database persistence is not that important to me. Uh, I don't want to fail the rest of my logic because of its failure. I therefore log it if it does fail, and I move on. I can have my blood sugar being submitted to an endpoint every two minutes and setting a metric. Now I have this gauge being updated every two minutes, I can make a Grafana dashboard which shows my blood glucose in real time. If you scan this QR code, you can see my blood sugar right now. As you can see, I can view trends over time and share it with anyone. I could even set up a monitor at home for the dashboard so I can glance at it. So now I can share my blood glucose with anyone, but it's kind of useless in isolation. The same as monitoring any complex system, context is really important. For example, if I've just eaten and there's a spike, but I've already taken insulin, it's nothing to be immediately worried about as insulin takes a little bit of time to work. I therefore wanted to build a quick way to add this context. Grafana supports annotations, but I didn't want to log into the dashboard every time I wanted to annotate, because I just wouldn't do it, to be honest. So I wanted to make it less of a, a burden. I therefore built a chatbot using Telegram that enabled me to add annotations. Telegram can be configured to send a webhook every time a bot receives a message. Here's what that looks like. The webhook receives a request. I validate the, mes the message, I marshal it, and I write back to Telegram to let me know if there was an issue processing it or anything like that. After this validation, I attempt to pass the ints uh, that I expect to be there, and then I call my annotation service before writing back to Telegram and saying everything was OK. My annotation service assigns tags to the message based on its content, and I send these to Grafana too. In Grafana, I assign colors to them, um, which allows me to very quickly at a glance see what the context behind those specific annotations were, which culminates in the above. So you can see an annotation being added on the left here, and it's showing up on the right almost immediately. So now I have a way to add context to my graph, which is really powerful for myself and other people viewing it to understand what's going on. If I do have a low blood sugar event, there's a lot of context around it, which is going to be really valuable not only now, but in the future when I refer back to figure out why it happened to. So now we have some great visibility, but we don't have any alerts. Guidance given to me by nurses is when my blood starts to go below four, I just start treating for it. And by treating, I mean having carbohydrates. I therefore wrote a tiny cron that checks my readings every five minutes, and if a reading is less than a predefined limit, it opens an incident. Encore again makes this very easy. You just define a cron like this in code. I also added this block to my Telegram bot to allow me to manually trigger an incident if for any reason I wanted to. And this is what that message looks like. So I'm opening incidents now, but what does that actually mean? So when I trigger an incident, it calls an incident microservice, which opens an incident on a tool I'm using called incident.io. I picked incident.io as it's the closest tool to Cloudflare's in-house tooling we have, and it's also completely written in Go. The reason I wanted to use an actual incident tool is it allows me to set up escalation policies, run reports, 
to see how much time is spent in the incident state, amongst other things. I'll talk about this a little bit more shortly. I know some of you are probably gasping that I skipped errors, but I promise I only did this to make sure it fit on one slide. Uh, one of the interesting sections in the code I'd like to draw your attention to is the error block after making a call to incident.io. So HTTP util has these two functions, uh, dump request and dump response. They're incredibly useful for debugging responses from upstream APIs, especially if you don't know the shape of them. But I haven't seen them used too much in the wild. You need to be really, really careful with these, as logging their response could lead to sensitive information ending up in your logs. But while you're developing stuff, these are incredibly useful. So let's get back to incident management. We now have the ability to create an incident, but the greatest value in doing so is that the relevant parties get notified and escalation happens as I discussed. So incident.io has this really nice ability to run workflows. This means I can configure rules similar to what you might do in a tool like Zapier and send notifications via text to folks who have subscribed. In this example, every time I open an incident, it's going to send a text message to me. And here's the message I would receive. If the incident isn't close to 20 minutes, it's going to automatically escalate to my partner or my siblings. Depends who likes me most on a given day. And with this, I'm able to create a pretty robust incident management workflow. One thing I mentioned previously is I wanted to use incident tooling because I could run reports. And by doing this, I've effectively got really powerful reporting for free. This allows me to see what and how many low blood glucose events I'm having over a given time frame. This, de this is demo data. Uh, I put together this presentation because thankfully my real data is much more boring. But you can see how powerful this is. Based on this graph, I'd be able to conclude the amount of low blood glucose events I'm having is trending up. So that would be a really good signal for me to engage with my doctor. Um, as what I'm doing currently is clearly not working for me and something needs to change. But what monitors the monitor? It's getting a little bit meta, meta here. But it's all well and good monitoring my blood glucose and having checks and balances in place. Or if the system monitoring it goes down, uh, then it all becomes somewhat redundant. So another nice thing about using Encore is I get quite a few insights for free. So you can see here over a period how many requests I've got, how many errors I've received. But this also uh, allows me to see when things do go wrong, I can quickly figure out why. My Telegram bot randomly stopped working, and it turned out I was getting a 404 from Grafana. I guess they were having a small incident at the time, and my dashboard and the ability to annotate were not available for a very short period. This was really easy to debug due to the visibility you get for free. When working on side projects, and even at work, it's really easy to spend time on things that don't provide value to you. And in the case of a side project, it's the number one reason I don't finish them. There's so many great tools out there. It's always worth to see which ones can kind of do the plumbing for you, so you can just focus on the bit you really want to achieve, which in my case was monitoring my blood glucose. I've only shown you a subset of features of my system today, but here's some other things um, I plan to build or have already built. So it's also really interesting to talk to here today because a lot of them align with kind of how, where I wanted to go next. Uh, so one thing that I'm doing today is I'm manually closing incidents. This made sense because I wanted to review what happened and make sure I understood them before kind of closing it out. But the problem with that is sometimes I forget to close them in time and it gets escalated. So someone else gets bothered, they have a panic um, when it was unnecessary. Uh, once my blood sugar starts to stabilize, I could very easily auto-close them. That's something I'm going to look at soon. I mentioned previously I'm storing all my blood glucose data in a database. But right now, I'm not really doing anything with it, even though I have a couple of years worth of data at this point. So it'd be great to train an LLM so I could have conversations with my own data. For example, why do I always go low at 3 PM on a Wednesday? I could maybe combine that with data from Strava or other sources to figure out what was going on around that beyond just sort of uh, eating. I could also have more graphs and measures. Right now, my graph is pretty basic, but it, it really does the job that I need it to do. But there are other measures of success as uh, type 1 diabetic. One of them is this measure called a HbA1c, which is your average uh, blood glucose over a 90-day period, which kind of shows how you're trending. That would be trivial for me to calculate. So that would be a good thing for me to start measuring too. And with the system so important, you can never have too many fail-safes. So adding more redundancy would always be a good thing. So let's wrap up. When I first got diagnosed with type 1, I was pretty scared. I thought it, was, it would be debilitating, and it would make my life really hard. I won't pretend it's been a breeze, but this project has really helped me understand my condition and to manage and monitor the best way I know how, as if it was a distributed system. Being able to code genuinely feels like a superpower, and it's enabled me to somewhat automate management of a condition that even as late as 1920 was a death sentence. The amount of amazing tooling written in Go is incredible, and I've made you pretty much, pretty much everything that um, contributes to this project was written in Go. Go's low latency and great standard library really enable me to move fast on this project. And while I make use of the languages in the future, 
I continue to make Goal my sensible default because it just works really, really well. For this specific project, having the confidence in the backwards compatibility guarantee given by the Goal team is a huge plus, as this is a, definitely the sort of application I want to just work for years to come. So one final bonus thing before I go, but if it doesn't work out for me as a software engineer, I intend to make and sell blood glucose art. Here's my first piece. So when the NFT market hots up again, you can look out and you can buy my uh, blood sugar as a cat. Uh, thanks so much. I've been Matt Boyle, and I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Matt, for sharing. There's just one question, but it's... Uh, so, one of the questions is, does the monitor stab your arm every two minutes? <laughs> no. Uh, so, effectively, when I put it in, it kind of stabs it once, uh, and then it stays in for two weeks, and I have to take it out again. So, I can always feel it. Um, when you've gone and had, like, a flu jab, you know, that sort of prick when the needle goes in? Like, I feel that when I put it in. But unless I catch it on a door, which happens sometimes, it's kind of painful, I don't feel it most of the time. And another question is, uh, Matt, what is the name of the device that you use? And is the code open source? Uh, the name of the device is called a Meow Meow, I think. M-I-A-O, M-I-A-O. Um, the code isn't open source. I wouldn't be against doing it. I just don't want to be responsible for other people's actions based on something so important. So I guess I'd have to look at proper licensing if I was to do that. Is there any questions in the room? You can also raise your hands, and I'll bring the mic to you. Not so much a question, <clears throat> more a statement. It just seems a bit crazy that these devices, the makers of these, these, these devices, keep it close. It's just crazy. Completely agree. I think, um, I imagine, there's, there's, there's kind of been a, like a lot more um, health fanatics and now more interested in their blood glucose too. So the, the market for blood glucose devices are hotting up, so it's not just a diabetic thing anymore. So I really hope out of that will lead to some sort of um, a disruption where we may get more open devices where people can build on top of them. Because to me, it makes sense. Like, you've already got open source stuff for running, for uh, weight, uh, for tracking calories. So I, I don't see why blood sugar should be any different. I did get one more question on your phone. Sorry, but it's locked. Uh, Matt, did you figure out why the second device works, even when the underlying one doesn't? So as far as I can tell, the underlying device is making a decision not to show, like, to show me my blood glucose, because it's dropping so aggressively, I think it doesn't want me to take an action, which it believes is the wrong thing for me to do. So it'd rather my blood sugar was more stable before it presented the reading, um, which I think makes sense for most people, right? They, the general advice given by doctors is if you've taken insulin or eaten, like, don't take any sort of drastic actions. Don't do it like, very quickly. For example, insulin takes two hours to work, roughly. So if you're seeing your blood sugar like going up, um, but you've already had insulin, you shouldn't take an action to try and resolve it to bring it down right, because it might happen in an hour in the future, for example. The only problem I have with that statement is like everybody's different, and like I, I kind of know what I need to do better than the device does, so I'd rather be empowered to make that decision myself rather than the device doing it on my behalf. Sorry, I locked your device again. <laughs> no problem. Okay, I think, I think that's yeah. it. Okay, thank you so much.